For he has not put the world to come of which we speak in subjection to angels. But one testified in a certain place, saying, What is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you take care of him? You made him a little lower than the angels. You crowned him with glory and honor and set him over the works of your hands. You have put all things in subjection under his feet. For in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. But now we do not yet see all things put under him, but we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone." So the writer has been encouraging his readers to recognize the superiority of the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and last time we were together, he was sharing with them concerning some things that related to their eternity. And, and you'll remember in verses 2 and 3 here in chapter, uh, chapter 2 how he had said, if the word spoken through angels proved steadfast and every transgression and disobedience received a just reward... How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed to us by those who heard him? So the last time we were together, we were looking at the reality of the message that was preached by the Lord Jesus Christ, and, and he had stated that we are not to neglect such a great salvation. To neglect a great salvation is another way of simply saying ignoring the only way to God. The only way to God is Jesus Christ, and therefore we are called to believe in Him because He is the only way. According to Acts chapter 4, verse 12, neither is there salvation in any other. There is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. That has been the message of the gospel from the very beginning. That is the exclusive message of Jesus Christ. That's why Christians cannot bow our knees to any other God or religion. That's why because we have commanded to, to give a message that is really a very strong and very, if you will, exclusive message. And uh, that's not real popular today. I, just before coming out of here, out here, I was thinking how many times I have watched people being interviewed on, on a national uh, syndicated programs and all, and, and the interviewer will be speaking to a pastor or an evangelical leader and, and will ask this question. He will say, um, are you as a Christian saying that unless people receive Jesus Christ that they will not enter into the kingdom of heaven? And I have watched so many times as uh, pastors and teachers really uh, begin to hem and haw over that because it sounds, it sounds so harsh, doesn't it, when you think about it? It really does. And yet that's what the Bible teaches. The, the Bible teaches Jesus himself saying this, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. And so the Scripture makes it very clear there is one God, there is one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. And so the Bible makes it very clear that there's one name, one name above all names. And that's why it's referred to as such a great salvation. It's a salvation that that it is great because it's a great sacrifice that God has uh, performed on our behalf and that He gave His Son, Jesus Christ. And, and so we're not to neglect so great a salvation because there is no other way of escape. If we were to neglect our great salvation, then we aren't going to be saved. And so this is a message. This is a message that, that came through Jesus Christ as He would walk the face of the earth and call people to faith in Himself. Jesus came and preached this message. That's what he means when, it, when he says in verse 3, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord. Jesus himself would speak concerning this as he delivered that message that he had received from his Father. Remember in John's gospel in chapter 15, verse 15, how Jesus said, all things that I heard from my Father, I have made known to you. So the Father had given to him the message. The message is that which he declared unto us. So as he gave this message, he, he discipled and, and he began to mentor, equipping people to also faithfully deliver the same message. And so what he did is he received words from his father, words of salvation, and he had these 12 men whom we refer to as apostles, and these men were given a commission to take the same message out. One of them fell through treachery, and that, that man was, was Judas, and and he was replaced by a man named Matthias, and then ultimately we know that the Apostle Paul joined their ranks, and, and they took this message, and they took it in a faithful fashion, 
but it began to be taught first by Jesus, was imparted to his men, and then his men from that point on have been giving the same message for centuries. And, and this is the message of this salvation that he's been referring to. Now, God was bearing witness, according to verse 4, both with signs and wonders, demonstrating the reality of this message as the power of God was made manifest as his men of God took this message throughout the world. So, moving on into verse 5 and continuing, he says, For he has not put in the world, put the world to come, of which we speak in subjection to angels. But one testified in a certain place, saying, What is man, that you are mindful of him, or the son of man, that you take care of him? You made him a little lower than the angels. You crowned him with glory and honor and set him over the works of your hands. You have put all things in subjection under his feet. For in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. But now we do not yet see all things put under him. So he's continuing. Notice in verse 5 he says, He has not put the world to come of which we speak in subjection to angels. You see, and we'll look at this in a moment just a little bit deeper, but after the return of Christ that is referred to as the second coming, uh, he's going to establish himself as uh, the king. He's going to rule over the face of the earth. Both the Old and the New Testament declares that. In, in Psalm 86, verses 9 and 10, for example, the psalmist said, All nations whom you have made shall come and worship before you, O Lord, and shall glorify your name, for you are great and do wondrous things. You alone are God. And so Jesus Christ is promised to return, and as he returns, he's going to establish his rule and his reign. Now, he gave this promise to his disciples in order that they might remain faithful to him, because the promise of his return is to produce a hope as well as an incentive to live a proper or a life that is worthy of the gospel. And so, let me say very briefly that biblical prophecy, which the, uh, the Bible is, is manifestly uh, filled with prophecy, well over a quarter of the Bible being prophetic in nature, uh, biblical prophecy is, is intended to produce in us a hope, a hope of the return of Jesus Christ. It's also to produce within us an incentive to live a life that is godly. And the knowledge of biblical prophecy is intended to produce Christ-centered lives. I've, I, I've burned around long enough to know that Sometimes we can take the Bible, and uh, especially prophetic passages, and like I said, there's so many books that, that are prophetic, uh, that we can begin to, um, to look to the nuances of the things that are being said and, and try and discover secret or hidden things within the prophecies. A, a lot of people are fascinated with uh, books like Revelation and others like that, or like to take away passages and, and look deeply into them in the book of Daniel, for example, or, or uh, various books like that. And we can get caught up with, uh, with knowledge of prophecy for its own sake. Uh, whenever there are times of crises, there are, there are always books that are being written uh, that, that intend to communicate to us things that we hadn't seen before, hidden things that are now being discovered. And and uh, I, I can remember that all the way back, uh, and this is not that far really, to some of you it may be a long time, to me it's, it's not anymore, but I remember back in 1988 there was a particular book that was written something like 88 Reasons Why Jesus Will Return in 1988. Do some of you remember that? It was out. There was a book, 88 Reasons Why Jesus Will Return in 1988. Uh, he didn't return. So the author the next year wrote 89 Reasons Why Jesus Will Return in 1989. Um, there have been books written over the years. Um, there are even movements that were founded on, on um, attempting to understand certain things in Scripture. The uh, Seventh-day Adventists uh, are a group that basically seem to have found their origin in speculation concerning the return of Jesus Christ and all. And you can see that in the history of the church, that prophecy in many ways has been an interesting subject. And yet at the same time, one of the things about prophecy that we need to understand is that uh, it's intended by God to produce something, and not just an ability for us to speak concerning, um, you know, the war in Iraq or what's going on with Al-Qaeda or m the Muslim movement. Those are all things of interest, and of course, uh, I can find myself interested in things like that. But how does that produce in me uh, a quality of life that is really reflective of a knowledge of Jesus Christ is the big question. 
if I um, know a lot of things about prophecy, but it doesn't change the way that I live, then it's not, not really doing me much good. But if I study the Word of God with an eye to change, and I see the return of Jesus Christ as an event that, that stimulates me, gives me incentive to live a godly life, then I'm really beginning to understand the purpose of prophecy. The knowledge that we live in the end times is intended to produce in us a hope. In John chapter 14, verses 1 through 3, remember what the Lord Jesus Christ said there. Listen, he said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. The word of God in reference to the return of Christ is a word of encouragement so that I can live with hope and anticipation. So I have a hope and an excitement about the return of the Lord Jesus Christ, but not only do I believe that he's returning, and not only do I hope in his return, but I also am encouraged to live a life of expectation that demonstrates that I really am serious that he's going to return, and therefore I'm preparing myself. Uh, in Titus, in chapter 2, verses 11 through 14, Paul said, The grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. And so what it does is it teaches us to live a holy and a righteous life in anticipation of being with him because Jesus Christ has promised to return. So knowledge of biblical prophecy is intended to produce Christ-centered lives. Now, notice that we're looking at this passage here in Hebrews in verse 5, chapter 2, how he says, He has not put the world to come of which we speak in subjection to angels. So this world to come, this inhabited earth is what he's speaking about, is in reference to the kingdom age. Now, when you study your Bible, you discover there's something called the kingdom age. It's when Jesus rules and reigns on the face of the earth for a thousand literal years. That concept is found in both the Old as well as the New Testaments. You can see it spoken of in the book of Isaiah, especially in the last chapters of that book. And you see that the Lord has given to us uh, insight that that is going to take place. Now, during that kingdom age, and this is what he's referring to, uh, angels are not going to rule. During that kingdom age, uh, God is ruling. So when he says, he has not put the world to come of which we speak in subjection to angels, during the kingdom age, the angels have no rulership. God is ruling. But not only is God ruling, incredibly, man is going to rule alongside of the Lord. You and I are going to rule and reign with him. Now, that's so beyond me. I don't, I, 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 as I even studied and prepared this and, and was just reviewing it, I thought, oh, that's a fantastic thought, that I'm going to actually be part of the rule and the reign of the Lord. But that's what Scripture teaches. If you take note, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 12. Paul said, if we suffer, we shall also reign with him. Revelation chapter 5, verse 10, he has made us unto our God, kings and priests, we shall reign on the earth. Uh, Revelation 20, verse 4, I saw thrones and they sat upon them. Judgment was given to them. I saw the souls of those who were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God and uh, who had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and they reigned with Christ for a thousand years. Revelation 20, verse 6, Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. On such the second death has no power. They shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. And so God has not placed the rule in reigning in the hands of angels. God has placed that in the hands of his son. He will rule, and we will rule alongside of him. And how that's going to take place, I really don't have detailed information about. But the point is, is he's saying here, listen, angels are not going to rule. Jesus Christ is going to rule. And because Jesus Christ is going to rule, then Jesus is greater than the angels. Jesus is better than the angels. Now, re redeemed man is only lower than the angels for a short time. 
uh, ultimately, we are elevated over even the angels. If you, if you take notes, 1 Corinthians chapter 6 makes that clear. This is interesting how he puts it. Paul said it this way. He said, if any of you has a dispute with another, does he dare take it before the ungodly for judgment instead of before the saints? And he goes on to ask a question. Don't you know that the saints will judge the world? And, and if you are to judge the world, are you not competent to judge trivial cases? Do you not know that we will judge angels? How much more the things of this life? What a question to ask. Do you not know that we will judge angels? What are you talking about? That we will judge angels? Well, the fallen angels rejected the rulership of God. They reject him in his rule, though they bow their knee to him. And so our presence, the fact that you and I will be in heaven and angels will be excluded is a testimony of the fact that God's word is true. And angels who rejected that word will actually be judged by our presence there alongside of God as we rule and as we reign with him. And so when he says in verse 5, he has not put the world to come of which we speak in subjection to angels, once again, it's another way for him to develop the superiority of Jesus Christ over angels. And he goes on in verse 6 and he says, but one testified in a certain place saying, what is man that you are mindful of him or the son of man that you take care of him? You made him a little lower than the angels. You crowned him with glory and honor and set him over the works of your hands. You have put all things in subjection under his feet. So at this point here in verse 6, he introduces a psalm. This psalm here is Psalm 8. It's a psalm of David. We all know King David because we read about him in Scripture and know that he has a son, a son that followed his lineage, a son that is Jesus Christ, who is referred to in the New Testament as Jesus, who is the son of David. David has been referred to in 2 Samuel chapter 23, verse 1, as the sweet psalmist of Israel. He wrote the Psalms, many of the Psalms, something like 76 of the Psalms that you find in the book of Psalms was written by this man by the name of David. We know that David was a shepherd, and as a shepherd, he would often sit in the desert, and as he sat there out in the desert, he would meditate. I mean, what else do you have to do? And he would be standing out there or, or sitting out there, and as he was out there, he would look up and he'd see the sky. And, and, and we in California can understand this to a degree because once in a while the sky is clear. And we'll go outside, and, and I have done this on many occasions, especially when we've gone either to the mountains or to the, uh, to the, uh, to the desert. And you can go outside, and you'll be seated outside, and if you just quiet for a while and there are no lights to distract you, when you begin to look around... And you, you begin to just hear the sound of the silence, how beautiful that can be sometimes, especially if you have kids. And if you're out there in the wilderness and you're looking up at the sky and you see the beauty of the sky, and a lot of us have done that, you have too, where you're, you're seated out there and you'll see a, a shooting star that just bursts on, on the scene and passes by. Man, it is so beautiful, isn't it? It is so beautiful, it is so peaceful, and it is so quiet. Well, David very often as a shepherd would be outside. And as he's out there and, and the sheep are, are, are resting and all, David would look at the sky. And as he looked upon the sky, he would begin to meditate. And as he began to meditate, he began to think of how great God is. He didn't look up to the sky and, and, and start saying, when I look at the heavens and the earth, I, I start thinking about that and I think within myself, man, am I something else? Am I a beauty to behold? He, he didn't do that. Because when he saw the creation of God, he became aware of his own finitude. He became aware of his own weakness. He became aware of the reality of the fact that he was just a speck on a small planet somewhere in a universe that was immense with uncountable stars. And as he would do that, he would look out there at this incredible, beautiful array of brilliant light, and he would consider man. And that's what he did when he would be out there. And he started thinking, what is man? That's what he says in verse uh, 6 here. What is man that you are mindful of him or the son of man that you take care of him? How humbled he was over that. 
Oh, I'd point this out to you. I had, didn't even notice this with you. Um, if you were to look in chapter 1, you'll see that there are various references that are made here. All through chapter 1, there are Scripture references that are made, uh, you know, are spoken of. All through chapter 1. And then you get into chapter 2, and you see Scripture. But I want you to see something. I didn't point this out. Verse 6, notice how he says it, but one testified. Notice he didn't say, but King David testified. But he said, but one testified. The reason he said, but one testified is because this is a well-known psalm. Everybody knew who one is that he's referring to. It's King David. But it's also interesting to note that he hasn't even mentioned who the writers are, the human authors are, because he has been considering how great God is and isn't in any way trying to, uh, to point to human authors. Basically wants them to keep their eyes on the Lord, and that's why he's not citing David or the others who had written. But the question is asked, what is man that you are mindful of him? Or the son of man, that you take care of him. I can remember my son David. My son David was probably about uh, six to seven years old. And we had taken his mama, we took Marie to, um, to the mountains. We were dropping her off for a weekend retreat with the ladies. And little David and I were walking together. David was wearing a baseball jacket as I was, and he had his little baseball hat on. And we were walking from, from the... Um, the lodge that we had dropped Marie off at, and we were walking through a pathway, and as we were walking, we began to look up between the trees, and you could see the beautiful stars, and I remember this very well as David and I were walking, looking up to the stars, and I was holding his hand, and I, I said to him, uh, son, I said, look up, look at the sky, isn't it gorgeous? And he said, yes, dad, it's beautiful. And, and I remember asking him a question. I said, son, I said, do you see those stars? And he said, yeah. I said, uh, how'd they get there? How'd those stars get there? And he looked at me. He was a little boy just listening to his dad. And he said, um, how did they get there, daddy? And I said, they got there because God placed them there, son, because those stars are creations of God. And I remember sharing with him. And, and you know, when your kids are small, you don't know whether you're getting through to them or not. But a few years ago for my birthday, my son gave to me a little poster of a boy and his father walking, and the boy is wearing a baseball jacket and a baseball hat, and the father had a baseball jacket on, and they were walking out in the similar kind of experience that he had had with me so long ago, and it said at the bottom of it, it said, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. It was something that my son had remembered, how that we together had made a memory. We looked up into the sky, and we saw how incredible and how beautiful those stars are. And those are the kinds of memories that I want my children to have, even as David is saying that. He's saying, I was outside, and I was looking up at the stars, and I thought for a moment, what is man? What is man? Because as I see the incredible beauty of God's creation, I realize how insignificant mankind really is. And yet, you are mindful of him. You think of us. You, you consider us. We are in your thoughts. In other words, even though we are insignificant, you desire to benefit us. You want to bless us. Psalm 40, verse 5 says, Many, O Lord, my God, are the wonders that you have done. The things you planned for us, no one can recount to you. Were I to speak and tell of them, oh, they would be too many to declare. So God, as incredible as this is, thinks about us. What is man that you are mindful of him or the son of man that you take care of him? Verse 7 you made him a little lower than the angels. You crowned him with glory and honor and set him over the works of your hands. Mankind in general is spoken of in this passage. And in creation, man is physical as well as spiritual and therefore has obvious limitations. And that makes him in a practical sense lower than the angels. When he says in verse 7 that we are a little lower, this speaks not only of position but also time, space, and also degree. This refers to a temporary condition. But he says, even though we are a little lower than the angels, verse 7, you crowned him with glory and with honor. In creation, man is God's crowning work above all other created life. Again, I've, I've brought this up to you before. All you need to do is look at the, uh, the Genesis account of creation, and you see that God speaks all things into existence. God said, let there be, and it was. And you see that through the days of creation until he gets to the ultimate creation. And then in the ultimate creation, which is given to us in more detail in chapter 2, you get some, some things in chapter 1 in more detail and particulars in chapter 2. You see the Bible speaks concerning the creation of man and how that God took the earth and formed it and then breathed into it 
and man became a living soul. And, and I've pointed this out to you every time I quote that passage, how that God using his hands to form man is intended to demonstrate to us his intimacy with us. That God, rather than speaking into creation, man actually forms man. And not only does he do so, but man is, is a lifeless, though beautiful form until God intimately produces life in us. And that's the picture when the Lord puts his face against the face of Adam and literally, as I've shared with you before, in an intimate fashion, he breathes into him the breath of life and he becomes a living soul. But the picture is an intimate connotation. It's a picture as if God were breathing life into man. And in doing so, what you have is a picture of God's devoted love to his creation. And so the next time you have this question, does God care about me, all you need to think about is the initial creation of how God created Adam and how he felt about him. Indeed, he loves you, and indeed, he created you in that fashion. And so, what has he done? Well, he has crowned him with glory and his honor because we are God's uh, crowning creation. He didn't bring the other animals and all other forms of life into existence in the way that he brought us into existence. Now, notice verse 8. He says, you have put all things in subjection under his feet. In the original creation, man was established as the one God gave dominion to, but the fall changed that. Initially, Adam had uh, dominion over everything, but the fall changes everything. If you take notes, Genesis chapter 3, verses 17 through 19, to Adam he said, because you listened to your wife and ate from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Uh, through painful toil, you will eat of it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you. You will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken. For dust you are, and to dust you will return. That ground is going to rebel against you because at one time it was producing naturally on its own incredibly luscious things, but now it's going to produce thorns. It's a lot easier for me to grow weeds than it is roses, I promise you that because it naturally produces those things. I go out there and I'll throw some seeds down for the grass and, and it's on, you know, I water and I take care of the fertilizing and all of that and the grass doesn't produce, but for some reason my sidewalk produces wonderful weeds. It amazes me. It's a lot easier for the weeds to grow than it is for the plants. And so at one time, nature itself was under man's dominion, but now it's in rebellion because of the fall. And that's what he's pointing to in verse 8 when he says, now we do not yet see all things put under him. Again, in, initially God intended to subject all things to man, but the fall undermined that. Man wasn't left uh, helpless, nor was he left hopeless because God intends to do something about that. So he says in verse 8, continuing, in, in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him, but now we do not yet see all things put under him. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. We see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for a little time. Thirty-three years, Jesus lived as man. And there was a purpose in that, and that is that he might taste or suffer death for everyone. Now, notice with me, he was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death. Jesus came in order to lay his life down voluntarily on our behalf. No angel ever did that. As I've mentioned to you before, in certain religions and religious expressions that prefer to call themselves Christian, they will sometimes speak things about Jesus Christ that are incorrect. I've mentioned this many times to you, how the Jehovah's Witnesses will say that Jesus Christ is the first creation of God. Jehovah's Witnesses will say that he is Michael, the archangel. But nowhere does the Bible teach that an angel laid his life down for my sin. Nowhere. The Bible teaches me that Jesus Christ did that, and he voluntarily did that. Turn your Bibles with me to John chapter 10 for a moment, please. John chapter 10. I want to show you this in Scripture. There was a purpose. Recently, somebody was writing in the local newspaper stating something about Jesus Christ, could have gotten married, could have had children. 
as if that is something that he could have done and would have done or perhaps might have been able to do. Um, the Bible doesn't teach that at all. The purpose of Christ's coming to earth was to suffer death for everyone. That's what we're looking at right here. And Jesus spoke about that in John chapter 10, verse 17 and 18. Therefore, my Father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This command I have received from my Father. So my Father loves me because I lay my life down. No one takes it. I lay it down voluntarily. Jesus Christ came and voluntarily lays his life down for us. He took upon himself human flesh, dwelt amongst men as man for 33 years. The purpose of his coming was that he might voluntarily, as a substitute, take upon himself the penalty that I deserve, that you deserve. It's called substitution. Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. Jesus Christ came that we might have our sins placed on him. God looked at him as the perfect sacrifice. In the Old Testament, God gave to us types in order that we might see him fulfilled those types in Jesus Christ. You had the scapegoat. You had the sacrificial lamb. But ultimately, what you have in the New Testament is Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. Jesus took upon himself my sin, and in doing so, bore it for me. And so, Jesus had a purpose. The New Testament teaches that he came with the purpose of voluntarily laying his life down for me. He wasn't murdered, and he wasn't martyred. He laid it down for me. And in doing so, he became that perfect offering and sacrifice to the Father. That's what's being referred to back in Hebrews chapter 2 when it says in verse 9, we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death. So Jesus took upon himself uh, human flesh in order that he might fully partake of death for everyone. Now, back in Hebrews chapter 2, 9, when it says, he by the grace of God might taste death, that word taste means to fully experience. It speaks of partaking of. And so it points out that the whole human race has been accused, tried, found guilty, and condemned. And so what he does is he tastes of death. When it speaks of him tasting of death, it's a picture of him taking a cup of poison. And every human being actually has a cup of poison that they themselves will take. They take of that poison because that's what sin does. But instead of others drinking the cup, Jesus drinks the cup on their behalf, and he takes that cup of poison into himself. He tastes fully of and partakes of that cup on our behalf. That's why in, in Matthew 26, verse 39, when Jesus was praying, that's why he said, Oh, my Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. But it wasn't possible. There was no other way for God to do the work of salvation other than the sacrifice of his own son. And that's what he did. And that's how he did it. He laid voluntarily, he put his son on a cross for us. And that's what makes him superior. No angel, no created thing ever did anything like that. Jesus Christ did, and he did it on behalf of everyone. Notice that in verse 9, when it says, by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. For every person who lived, who is about to live, who will ever live, Jesus Christ died. He died in order that we might trust in him. You see, his atonement was on behalf of everybody. In 1 Timothy 4.10, we have put our hope in the living God, who is the Savior of all men, especially of those who believe. He is the potential Savior and the actual Savior. He is the actual Savior of the person who trusts in the Lord Jesus Christ. He is actually your Savior. So when I stand before God, and if God were to ask a question like this, if God were to say to me, why should I allow you into heaven I could say to him, because of what your son Jesus did for me. 
He is my Savior. I trusted him. I opened my heart to him. I asked him to forgive me my sin. I was washed clean by his blood. The Holy Spirit indwelt me, and, and I lived for you, demonstration of the reality of salvation. The reason that heaven is open to me is because your son made it possible for me to enter in, and I have trusted him with my life. And the Father can say at that point, enter in. He is my actual Savior, but he's the potential Savior of all mankind. So prior to the day of my coming to Christ, he was my potential Savior in the sense that I could receive him as Lord and Savior and be saved, but I had yet to do that. So Jesus Christ is the Savior of all mankind, especially those who believe. He is able to save anyone, and he take you from the, it's been said he can take you from the guttermost to the uttermost. He is able to save in that way. He can take you from whatever life you were living and bring you into a place of blessing. He can do that, but he will do that if I but humble myself and ask. And so Jesus Christ is better. He's better than the angels because Jesus Christ voluntarily was made lower for a period of time to taste death for all mankind in order that we might be able to have life through him. If I open my heart to Christ and receive him, then I am transformed, I'm born again. If I reject him, then there, is, there remains no, no uh, offering for my sin because I have rejected the only means of salvation that God has offered to man. You'll see that later on as we go into the book of Hebrews a little more deeply. But Jesus Christ, from chapter 1 all the way through the book, 13 different times is presented as being better. And here he is once again being emphasized as being better than the angels. He is superior to the angels even though he took upon himself human flesh, and even though he tasted death, he did so for us in order that we might have a relationship with him.